Okay, so I've shared my screen, so I hope you can see the reliability workbench. And I've built a, just a very, very simple um, fault tree to sort of show how Markov works within the fault tree framework and how we can use it in um, in support of and in addition to the fault tree. So just to give a little bit of a background on why we might want to use Markov analysis and a reliability analysis, let's start by talking about the fault tree analysis. And by the way, I'm going to talk about fault tree, but also again, the RBD module of reliability workbench also ties into Markov in the same way. So everything I talk about with regards to fault tree, you could also mentally substitute RBDs and um, you know, it, it applies the same. So just to give, again, just to give that, that background, um, fault tree analysis is a very powerful tool for, for performing reliability analysis. However, one of the things about the background equations that support an analytical fault tree model is that they generally assume independence. This is because of the mathematical laws they're based on. The mathematical equations um, are the fine print in those equations that they apply for independent probability occurrences. What that means is the basic events in a fault tree are generally assumed to be independent from each other. What that means is that what's going on with one basic event really has no bearing on what's happening with another basic event. So again, I have a very, very simple fault tree here, which is just a very simple pump system consisting of two pumps. And so the fault tree models would assume that pump one is an independent beast from pump two, and what's going on with the failures and the availability of pump one is a completely separate matter from what's going on in pump two. And that's just because, again, because of the mathematical equations that are used in, uh, in analytical fault tree analysis. Of course, if you're a more advanced user, you might know a little bit about common cause failure models as one caveat to that. There's a way of specifying certain failure modes affect both pumps and they're not really completely independent. But there could also be other um, codependency, I guess you could call it, uh, or dependencies between the two pumps. Um, for example, just, just to name a few, um, there could be something such as maintenance dependencies. Maybe you have two pumps, but I only have one repair crew. So if both pumps were to fail, I could only repair one at a time. And therefore the MTTR on the second pump is longer because it has to wait for the first for the repair crew to finish with the first pump. Now, if they're independent, we are assuming that their the repair processes will be independent. But if they have the maintenance dependency, that would be again introducing some dependency that's not really accounted for in the general fault tree methods. That's just one example. Another one would be maybe a dependency on common spare parts. We have a limited stock of spare parts that both pumps are drawing from. Mm -hmm. So there's these other possible dependencies between components that there isn't necessarily a good way to tackle in a fault tree. Now these types of dependencies don't come up too often, and often when they do, you can sort of fudge it or ignore it, you know, some some way. But uh, to get a really accurate example, uh, accurate calculation um, in like critical applications, we may want to very accurately model dependencies between components, and that's where we might move into the Markov analysis. So Markov analysis is a uh, analysis method that's suitable for really generally small systems. We don't want to build an entire, you know, the entire fault tree. You might build a fault tree for like an entire car or an entire, entire airplane. You wouldn't want to do that in Markov. You'd want to just, just take one very small section of it, maybe part of a subsystem and model that in a Markov. The reason for that is because it gets very big and complex and unwieldy very quickly. So the first rule is we're gonna try and keep it small and simple. Uh, we're going to use it, generally the most common way to use it is to take one small part of a system that has some quirk about it, some dependency that um, you can't really, when you get right down to it, you can't really accurately do in a fault tree. So what we can do is we can model that in Markov and then attach that Markov model to a fault tree. And so we'll, we'll see how we can do that within Reliability Workbench. So let's take that two pump system we had. And I mentioned one possibility for dependency. It's common is a uh, common maintenance dependency. In other words, there's only one repair crew. And when one of the pumps fails, if the other pump fails, it has to wait, it has to wait for the first pump to finish repairing before it can begin its repair process. So let's build a Markov model to examine that. So I'm just gonna create a very simple Markov model. So this is my two pump system. I'll just call it two pumps or pump sys. Okay, and I'm going to draw a very simple Markov um, diagram. Again, I'm, I don't want to go 
into too much detail. Uh, I'm trying to keep this as a simple overview. So I'll draw the diagram with just a very high level overview of what I'm doing. So the Markov diagram is what's known as a state transition diagram. Each one of these little ovals represents a state of the system. The state is, could, could be like any way of thinking of the system, like system available is a state. Um, one component failed with no available spare parts is another possible state that you might have in, a, in another system. A state is just any discrete um, configuration that the system could exist within. Okay, so for this particular example, I'm gonna have three states. The first state is gonna be where both pumps are working. So I have, when I double click on it, I can uh, give it either a short or a long description. I'll use long descriptions to be a little more clear. So there's both pumps working. The next state down, oh, by the way, let me change my view options to show those long descriptions. Okay, now we get our, our verbose text. The middle state here is where one of our pumps has failed and the other is still working. One pump failed, one working. There we go. And then the final state down here will be where both pumps have failed. All right, so I get. I hope you sort of get from this example what those states can represent, basically the different um, states that the system can exist within. This final one, we're going to click on availability state, and that means when the system is in this state, it's unavailable. The second thing we define is the transitions between the states. How do we move from one state to another, and specifically how frequently? Uh, the failure rates or the repair rates are really what are we, we're using to define those transitions. So let me define some transitions. We have uh, different um, styles, basically visual styles, whether it's straight or whether it's curved and what direction it's curved. So I'll use the clockwise transition. And so we can transition from both pumps working to one pump working and one failed. If, if one of the pumps fails, we make that transition. And if the other pump fails, we transition to the state where both are failed. We can also transition back up the ladder by repairing. Right, so I'll just click to add those transitions. Transitions have rates associated with them, how often it occurs. So the, these transitions would be defined by the failure rate. These transitions would be defined by the repair rate, right? So the bank uh, uh, sort of defines how, how, they, how we move through the system. So again, I'm gonna create a generic parameter. This kind of works like the generic parameters in a fault tree, the generic failure models. So I'm gonna create a failure rate. So that opened up on my other monitor for some reason. The cool thing, this is one of my favorite things about the Markov, this, um, when I'm defining a parameter, this short description field here, uh, the font used in this field is the symbol font, which is used for Greek characters. So whenever I press a letter, it's gonna give me the lower, the uh, Greek equivalent. So if I press L, uh, it gives me a lowercase lambda. So that's traditionally used for uh, failure rates. Right, so then the long description, the English for that will be the failure rate. And this way I can use Greek symbols like I would in my failure models. My you know, traditional you know, failure rate and repair rate are usually given as lambda and mu. Let's say, let's just suppose that our pumps have a failure rate of um, two failures per year as their, as their constant rate. Okay, since this transition, there are two pumps, both of them can fail. I'll use a parameter multiplier of two because two of them are working, either of them can fail. So the failure rate, the transition rate here is twice the failure rate of a single pump, okay. So I can do that for this other one. Now we only have one pump working. So I'll just assign that failure rate down here to get the transition to the both pumps failed. And then to go back up, we use the repair rate. So let me just quickly define a repair rate uh, parameter. Again, I'll use the lowercase m, gives me a mu. We'll call it the rate, the repair rate. And let's say, um, again, we're using rates here. So I'll say a constant base rate of 100 repairs per year. It's not necessarily the most intuitive uh, units for thinking of things. But what that works out to is about a, a repair rate of about uh, three and a half days, around three and a half days to repair. Or if you prefer, about uh, 87 hours to repair. OK, so I'll click OK again. And again, assign the same uh, repair rates up here as well. Okay. So I've built the Markov model to represent that two pump system, taking into account that if both pumps are failed, only one can be repaired at a time. And that's why this, uh, this repair transition here, is just a single repair rate when both are failed, right? So that's how, what's gonna separate this from a fault tree model. 
Okay, once I've built my Markov model, I can run it. Actually, before that, I might want to set some um, analysis options. Uh, firstly, the lifetime. Well, let's look at this over a 10-year lifetime. There's various other things uh, related to the um, uh, how it performs calculations. I don't really need to get into that in a simple overview. So select OK, and I'll click the green traffic light. And I'll get some lifetime results for this uh, system, this uh, pump system. Uh, it gives us a, meet, an, a lifetime unavailability and availability, unreliability, reliability, failure frequency, repair frequency, et cetera, all these different um, uh, reliability metrics. Probably we're most interested in either the point lifetime or the mean um, life, mean unavailability, either lifetime unavailability or mean. We might also be interested in um, unreliability, sometimes useful, or also um, failure frequency is another commonly used parameter. For the sake of the fault tree, I think we're primarily going to be looking at this value right here, unavailability and failure frequency. Those two are what's going to end up going into the fault tree model. Okay, so I've built this simple Markov model to represent this, this complex dependency that's a little more than what a traditional fault tree can, can um, traditional fault tree methods, again the fault tree equations, can't, you can't say two events have a common repair, have a, have a hold for your repair dependency in traditional analytical fault tree methods. So let me go back to the fault tree and show how we can include the system. So rather than breaking it down into separate basic events for each pump, I've modeled the entire pump system in a single um, Markov model, which I can then attach to a basic event in the fault tree. So let's um, create a new fault tree. So I've created a new top event and we're gonna add a new basic event. And of course, if you're familiar with fault trees, if you use them a while, you know how to add a failure model to a basic event. You can create a generic model and drag and drop it to attach it, or you can double click on the basic event and assign a failure model this way. You probably have familiarity with that. You may have also seen this use Markov model checkbox and just kind of always ignored it because you never had a use for it. Well, this is where we have a use for it. I can click that checkbox and now the failure model for this basic, basic event, rather than using one of the 18 built-in failure model types for the fault tree, I can use a um, Markov model that I've uh, previously created. Say that uh, pump system. So I can assign it, associate it with the um, basic event. And now that entire, or that entire pump system, two pump system is modeled with this single basic event right here. Okay, so let me set some uh, project options. Again, I wanna set that uh, 10 year lifetime. And then I can run the calculations to see how this compares with the uh, fault tree quote unquote equivalent. I click the green traffic light to run the analysis. Again, we'll get the same unavailability that we got for the Markov model, but let's compare that to the fault tree we had built that didn't take into account the maintenance dependency. The unavailability here, let me actually zoom in on that a bit so it's a little easier to read. I don't know what resolution you're, you're going to be looking at. The unavailability when we build it normally quote unquote, it's gonna be 3.8 times 10 to the negative four. When we take into account the uh, maintenance dependency, that strong dependency on the maintenance, it's 7.6 times 10 to the negative four. So it's about twice as high because now we're capturing that only one pump at a time can be repaired. So again, this is just an overview of how you can build a Markov model and associate it with a basic event um, in a fault tree and therefore use the Markov to, to quantify some small complicated section of your fault tree. And again, I've given a very simple example and technically when you get right down to it, one that you don't actually have to use Markov for, there's a built-in failure model within fault tree called the standby model that does exactly that, what I just described where you have a maintenance dependency with an, a limited number of repair crews. The way the standby model works is, you guessed it, it has what's called an implicit Markov model. It's going to use the Markov calculations to quantify this failure model, but it does exactly what I just did explicitly by building a Markov model. Again, this was a very simple example, but there's all sorts of cases um, where you might have some um, strong dependency between the basic events in your fault tree, and the fault tree results as a result will not be perfectly accurate. So you might need to more accurately capture that um, dependency between your components. 
Okay. Again, this was very simple. If you want a little more uh, information on that, well, our our uh, online fault tree training course uh, provides a lot more information on the Markov and how to build it, and more examples for um, um, more examples for for the Markov model and when you might use it. Uh, with that, Clint, are there any questions before I hey, get back? Thanks, Joe. That's great. Again, this is just a, a basic overview of Markov. If you have additional questions. As a, a current customer, please reach out to us. We're happy to answer your questions. Um, and if you are interested in the software, like I say, visit our website. The, the trial is absolutely free, no credit card required, and, and you can find that at uh, isograph.com. Hey, thanks again, Joe, for your time today, and, and um, we look forward to hearing from you. Okay.